Some of you might be pretty sick of seeing my face. I've, I've been doing a lot, and um, it occurred to me in the sessions this morning that not everybody knows even what NMO is, so I feel like I ought to start there. Um, who knows what NMO is in the audience? Okay, so that leaves quite a few of you who don't, so I'm just going to very, very briefly talk about what it is and how it relates to transverse myelitis and why we're here. Um, so neuromyelitis optica is a recurring autoimmune disorder of the central nervous system that preferentially targets the optic nerves and spinal cord, and you accrue disability with each inflammatory event. So the purpose of um, treatment is first to put out the fire, and second, to prevent the fire from happening in the first place, or in the next place, I should say. So we're gonna talk about some, uh, where we are with treatment for this disease, and then where we're going. Uh, there's a lot of exciting things, so um, let's start with the acute treatment. So right now, the standard of care, uh, probably not very surprising to any of you, because basically many of you got this, uh, is uh, methylprednisolone for five days, as well as more often than not, plasma exchange. So we know that suboptimal improvement um, does suggest that we ought to give plasma exchange, and in NMO, most improvement is suboptimal. So, um, and we did some data analysis to really establish that. We looked at our patients with, who had just received IV methylprednisolone, and we looked at our patients who received both IV methylprednisolone and plasma exchange. And these, just to familiarize you, are box plots. So when a patient, prior to their next event, this is what their disability score looked like. And so the higher up on this graph, the worse, the more disability that a patient has to start off with. And then at, when the patient presented with a new relapse, um, you can see that the scores got higher, suggesting that they accrued disability as, as would be expected. So with uh, IV methylprednisolone, when they got discharged, they didn't look very different, but then at follow-up, they did look different. These lines, this is the median line, and this is the 75th percentile, 25th percentile, just to give you a little bit of sense. And we looked also just at how many patients returned to baseline, returned to whatever their function was prior to this event. And with methylprednisolone, only about a third do, but when you add plasma exchange, about two-thirds do. So it really uh, suggests that it's a good consideration to make when you have the resources to make it. Um, and also being explored is plasma exchange by itself, just saying, gosh, so many people need plasma exchange, why are we even bothering with steroids if so many people are suboptimally responsive? And so that's being investigated now. Uh, but other acute treatments have been tried as well, and we'll talk about a few trials, all very small trials. Uh, the first one involves comp complement, so a complement system, um, is it complements your immune function, and so what we are trying to do is block that system and kind of disrupt the, the inflammatory process from occurring. And so we know that there's a lot of complement deposit in NMO lesions. In fact, uh, both Claudia Lucanetti at her lab at Mayo as well as our own Dr. Michael Levy and his uh, have confirmed this and others. Um, and so we used a medication called Synrise. It's a C1 complement inhibitor, and to disrupt, like I said, that complement system. It was a small study, just 10 patients, uh, but it really did suggest, if you look at these box plots, and you look at the one on all the way here on the left, and this is where patients ended up after their, at, at presentation from their relapse, and you can see that on follow-up, the boxes are quite similar. The median is, um, is exactly the same. And so most patient, <clears throat> patients returned to their baseline when we included uh, complement inhibitor in their acute treatment. So we decided, why not try another acute treatment? So we did. This one was bevacizumab, um, which is a medication that blo blocks VEGF. And so basically, the idea behind it is that it seals off the blood-brain barrier. We know that the immune system is getting into the central nervous system and disrupting things. And so if we can shut the door so that nothing can get into the central nervous system, that was kind of the point of this study. The results were not as robust. Um, again, though, even I should remind us that we're talking about small groups of patients even with the first study and with this one as well, with all three of them. 
But you can see that patients often, when you look at this median line, did not return back to their baseline. They really stayed kind of as disabled as they were when they presented with a new event. It's a little hard to know what to make sense of this because the whole point of this medication in particular was to block off the blood-brain barrier. So they may not have gotten as bad functionally as they otherwise would have, but we just have no way of knowing. And then our, oops, I'm going the wrong way or something. Okay, and so then, uh, sorry about that. We also tried acute B-cell depletion. So we know that B-cells, um, create antibody. We know antibodies are involved in NMO in some way, and so we wanted to see what happens if we just deplete all the B cells altogether, which many of you are familiar with B cell therapies. You've heard the term rituximab probably too many times over the last couple of days. So we wanted to see what happens. We do that to, to maintain um, treatment to prevent relapses, and we wanted to see if it would have any effect on, um, on when you present initially with the relapse. This was only five patients, so this was a tiny, tiny uh, study, three of whom were able to be depleted of their B cells, two of whom never depleted, and two of whom relapsed before 90-day follow-up. So we couldn't really draw many con conclusions, except that the dosing that the company had suggested was probably not the best dosing, because it, uh, it didn't allow our patients to not relapse. And so there are lots of new ideas on the horizon even beyond this, um, in, including neuroprotection, which I think somebody's going to be talking about later, which moves us right into preventative treatment. I feel like I'm dating myself by having used this slide, but this was a big ad campaign in the 80s, and hopefully some people know who this is. Um, but the, the idea is only you can prevent forest fires, so we're trying to prevent the fire from even starting at this point. So here are a list, oh man, I didn't mean for this to come out so slowly, of all the FDA treatment, uh, FDA approved treatments for multiple sclerosis. It wasn't that long ago that there was nothing on this list. But here's the list of NMO treatments that are approved. There's none, there are none, goose egg. So we're working on that though, and we do have data from uh, off-label use of other medications that are FDA approved that uh, that have suggested that there's benefit to some of these medications, and they've also provided proof of concept for some of the trials that are being used right now. So included in that is azathioprine, rituximab, mycophenolate, and tocilizumab, as well as a couple others. I know that you're, nobody can see that, and it's really not the point. It's really just the point to let you know that there has been investigation, although not in a, very, not in a controlled way for the most part. So now we're in trials. There are three trials that are currently uh, being pursued in to try and get something approved for neuromyelitis optica. Um, and we probably have some representation from maybe some of these companies here today. But the idea is we want to we wanna see what the failure rates are and see what the time to first relapse are. Those are kind of our, out point, our, our outcome measures. And just to give you a sense of how we calculate this, these dots all represent relapses, oopsie. And um, then we give a medication and then we follow the patient and then when you see dots on this side of that line, that means that they relapsed despite being on treatment. So just to give you a, a sense of what we're looking at. So there's a consensus among many NMO practitioners that azathioprine, mycophenolate, and rituximab are among the most popular choices. And we put together our data, uh, Johns Hopkins, UT Southwestern, and Mayo Scottsdale, and looked at what the failure rates looked like, and which, again, can help inform what products should be tried you know, in the future and, and what we are doing now. But from there, there's a certain path that you have to establish to uh, get FDA approval. You need to make sure the drug is safe before you can make sure that you have the right dose, before you can make sure that it's efficacious. So again, we want to make sure it's effective and as effective as what we standardly use now, which um, arguably rituximab is among, the, is among the best, not arguably among the best, but 
arguably the best of the treatments that we have. And then, of course, we def definitely don't want to do anything to worsen a patient in any way, so we want to make sure these therapies are safe. So the first one is eculizumab. That's, they were the first trial to launch. This is also a complement inhibitor. So we talked about complement inhibitor and disrupting that complement system. And it's currently approved for a couple other diagnoses. So that helps in terms of the safety part. Um, and then it's dosed uh, by IV every two weeks. And there is an infection risk. There's a meningi meningococcal risk uh, that happens. So in the pilot study, uh, there were 10 pa 14 patients, 12 of whom were relapse-free, two of whom had questionable to mild relapses. Um, and then, as, as mentioned, there was somebody that had a men meningococcal sepsis, but then was able to recover just fine and go back on therapy. So now there's a phase three study. So we know we have proof of concept that this medication works in NMO quite effectively, and I didn't mention that actually these patients, some of patients actually improved in their function. So it suggests that if you let the immune system rest, you let the neurologic system rest, that you are able to achieve the best, uh, uh, the best recovery that you can from your old attacks. So um, there is a placebo arm, so patients are either on this medication or they're not, but it's in the setting of a background therapy. So they're oftentimes on mycophenolate or azathioprine to, to ensure that they're not um, endangering themselves by being in this trial. Each of the trial designs are a little bit different. And enrollment's completed, and we're just kind of waiting and seeing following these patients. And then the second drug is SA-237, which is an extended release, of tos, uh, extended release version of tocilizumab, which also we've looked at. And we're going to um, look at some of the studies on tocilizumab so that we know where this information comes from. But in general, tocilizumab is FDA approved. And so we do have some good safety data there. But this one is extended release, so it's less frequent dosing. And there was a tocilizumab phase one study. There were two of them, actually. And it, it's a little bit of a busy graph. I don't love this. These look like they might be mistaken for relapses, but they're not. They're just where the medication was dosed. But there's a signal that suggests that this was a great proof of concept and that this medication works. What's more than that, not what's more than that, but what's also important to note is that it had a robust uh, effect on pain. So unlike most immunotherapies, this one, blocking IL-6, actually has an effect on pain. And so patients, they did use that as a secondary outcome measure, which um, ought to be done more often in trials. And so I'm glad that in both of these, actually, it was done. Um, so the design of this study is such that there's a, a two-to-one placebo arm, so you have two-thirds of a chance of being on active drug, one-third of a chance of being on placebo, and you're on placebo until you have a relapse, and then you move in on to therapy. And again, enrollment is done, and we're just kind of waiting for people to uh, have their relapses. I should note that the, the United States design for this medication was different from the rest of the world, where there was no placebo arm or there was a placebo arm, but still with background therapy, such as the first trial. And then the third one is, huh, this one's a mouthful, inebolizumab. Hopefully when they come up with their trade name, it'll be a little bit easier to say than inebolizumab. But um, this one is also B cell depleter. So again, we're just trying to muck up something in the immune system so that the immune system doesn't do anything we don't want it to be doing. And so this one depletes all B cells in the same, in similar fashion to rituximab, which we have probably the most observational retrospective data on than any other medication. So that provides our proof of concept for that medication. We do know in rituximab that you can have increased risks of infections, so that's something that we're looking out for. Um, this medication is a three to one uh, uh, placebo, treatment to placebo rate such that for every three patients who are on treatment, one is on placebo, and no patient is on placebo for more than a half a year. And enrollment is ongoing still, and um, 
so it's the, really the important part is that there's a lot of promise in these therapies. And uh, the acute ones may apply more broadly beyond NMO because none of these ther therapies are particularly specific to NMO. Um, and so th this exciting research can be extrapolated and perhaps even used for other, other autoimmune diseases of the central nervous system. And that's actually all I have to say. <laughs>